First Timothy chapter two. We're moving along. I'm going to read the first eight verses. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's a powerful passage of Scripture. Paul not only got over the, not only did not get over the grace of Jesus Christ in his own conversion, He never got over the call of God upon his life. That's what he says in verse 7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I'm ordained to preach the things that I have just expressed to you. That is the burden that rests upon me. And really this passage, I believe, reveals the heart of the Apostle Paul, who was set apart by God to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles, or that word translated Gentiles is the word for nations, outside of the realm of the Jews, Israel, which of course at that time was the mindset of so many of the Jews, and I'll say more about that probably in next week's message. But perhaps it's not possible to know why it is that Paul begins where he does here in this letter in chapter 2. He has set it up really as he's talked about some of the problems. There's problems in the church and Timothy's been left there with a charge to deal with those problems. And then right out of the gate, he deals with this issue that we find in these first eight verses. And it is the issue really of prayer. And prayer in relationship to the gospel and taking that gospel to the world. Now we, we know about the, the law teachers that were there. We heard about them in chapter one who distracted the saints from the supremacy of Jesus Christ in the gospel. They were focused on other things. They were stirring up divisive discussions about speculative matters that Paul characterized as fables or myths, uncertainties at best, that were made a primary focus in at least the Ephesian church and the churches that were affected by the church at, at Ephesus. So it's it's, it's possible that this is why the apostle is making the emphasis that he's making in chapter 2. The first thing that he, that he deals with is a clarification of that which Christ has done. It's also possible that the church had become internalized with deep truths, as we often like to call them. You know, the truths that you find in the Ephesian letter. You know, when you read the Ephesian letter, you... You're on the deep end of the pool, aren't you? I mean, you go into that first chapter, and it's 
There are concepts there that are overwhelming. You keep moving in chapter 2 and 3, and there's concepts that just, that can really just, they, in fact, one of the prayers of, of the Apostle Paul was that the Spirit might strengthen the inner man to be able to take in these truths. I mean, to be able to be affected and to be filled with the fullness of God. This thing is, and to comprehend that which is incomprehensible. And so we, we probably like the Ephesian church. We, we like to get together and we like to have our deep studies. We like to dive in and there's nothing wrong with that. And then we like to minister to one another. Remember the Ephesian letter in chapter 4. One of the points of emphasis that you might grow up into the likeness of Christ as a body of people ministering to one another. And there's a huge emphasis in the Ephesian letter on that. And so sometimes as a church, we can get so involved with this internalization of everything that we become disconnected from the fundamental truth that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come into the world to park Himself with a few isolated people in a building that we can hunker down and make it to the end together. But that can, sometimes that kind of spirit can get a hold of us as it may have gotten a hold of the Ephesian church. In other words, the church... Existing in this world is not the end of the mission. The mission involves the church in this world. And that's something that Paul is driving at here in this context. In fact, it is even possible that perhaps this church had become complacent. And that can happen. It could be that there had been a... a, a, a a certain theolo true theological perspective that had overwhelmed their minds and led them to improper conclusions. They may have concluded, as some in our own day, if God has chosen, and you know the Ephesian letter is big on that, if God has chosen, then He's going to save without our participation. And you know that's the very argument that was thrown at William Carey when William Carey was burdened to go to the heathen. You know, we've got to take this message to the heathen. To which she was, someone replied, sit down, young man. You know, one of the older divines. Sit down, young man. If God wants to save the heathen, He'll do it without our help. And that kind of mindset can creep into theologically sound churches. You know the Ephesian church was theologically sound? Go read Ephesians chapter 2. Or, no, Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. The letter to the church at Ephesus. They were doctrinally sound. Practice, they were sound. Something was missing. Perhaps that had begun to occur. And Paul is writing here to correct some of those things and Whatever the reason, I say I'm, I'm, I'm really speculating. We're not told why it is that Paul begins where he does in this letter addressing this problem. But whatever the reason, he gets right to this great need in the church. And it is this, prayer, 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 especially in relationship to the mission of the church to take the message of the gospel truth to the world. Now, there are significant statements of doctrinal truth in this passage. Some even believe that some of the statements in here were taken out of some early uh, doctrinal statement that was in the church. I, I don't know if that's true or not. But they do sound like they could come from that. They're just these one-sentence statements that are made, especially in verses 3 through 6. So that's possible. But whatever the case... It is clear that Paul is driving at more than just a, a doctrinal dissertation here. In verses 1 and 2, Paul is expressing the primary or exhortation 
that is then defended in verses 3 through 7. You see the exhortation in verse 1. He's exhorting that prayer be made for all men. And then in verses, verse 3, you have that connecting word, for. It doesn't exist in some of the modern translations, but it's a proper translation here. For. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Verse 5, another connecting word. For. These are words that are, that are indicating reasons for the exhortation to pray for all men. Pray for all men for. Pray for all men for. And then in verse 7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. Connecting Paul's ministry to the reasons that he has given for the exhortation to pray. And then in verse 8, you notice he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. And so he continues to connect the emphasis that Paul is giving here to the church and to the churches, by extension, us today, to pray in relation to reaching the world with the gospel. And that's why I want to focus today upon this reality, this exhortation from this passage. Not getting so much involved with some of the doctrinal points of this passage, which I trust to enter into more next week. But I want you to come away from the message today feeling what Paul wants us to feel, feeling what the Holy Spirit wants us to feel, and that is the burden of necessity that we as a church must pray. Must pray. And in particular in relationship to the responsibility that is upon us to take the gospel to the world. You see, God our Savior, God our Savior, You ever pray that way? God, our Savior. God, our Savior, has designed prayer as a vital part in bringing the truth of the gospel to the world for the salvation of all men. Prayer is more significant than most of us realize. I want you to be careful as we proceed in the message here. Please, 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 I beg of you to be careful not to allow theologizing to lose the point of the passage. To miss the burden of the passage. To miss the reason why these words are being written. Don't allow the the thoughts that may come to your mind as you hear the message progress to be a, to affect you away from the primary thrust, and that is the exhortation to pray and to pray in the way that He's telling us to pray, and for the reasons that He's telling us to pray. In fact, as a side note here. Uh, verse eight to me is a, is a is kind of a difficult verse, and I haven't fully unlocked what the apostle is meaning by the things that he says. But this thought did occur to me. When he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, and this phrase, without wrath and doubting, that seems so strange to me. Why why is he saying that? Without wrath and doubting, without anger and doubting or disputing. That's the That Greek word that's used there is translated in the King James in Romans 14 without doubtful disputations. This sort of contentious arguing. And as I thought about that, I, I thought it may very well speak to the theological tension that often exists between brethren that negatively affects our praying together in the way that Paul exhorts. In other words, we read a passage like this and what we want to do is pull out our swords and bludgeon one another over our disagreements on what he's actually saying in the theological portions and we never get to praying. And the very point is, pray. I exhort you to pray. I will therefore that men pray. Lifting up holy hands without wrath, without that anger, without that doubting, that disputating that goes on oftentimes between believers 
in a church. One of the greatest hindrances to prayer is that very thing. Anger, divisions, problems between one another. You know that's true, don't you? You know that's true in your own home. Come on, men, don't you find it hard to pray with your wife when you have a rift going on? Don't you? I mean, the last thing you want to do is pray with her, right? You don't even know if she's saved at that moment, right? So you don't want to pray with her. And the same thing goes on in the church. We have these disagreements, and it affects us. It disturbs us to the point where even if we pray, it's not true prayer. We're just mouthing words. We need to understand prayer in the church is an absolute priority. And anything that would hinder our praying. And hey, men, you know what can hinder your praying? Yeah, your relationship with your wife. That's another message. But still, I'm saying there are things that can hinder your praying. And prayer is so vital. It is so significant for the church. It's, it's important that we pray individually, privately, away from everyone else. But here we're looking at prayer in the context of the church. When we're gathering together, prayer in the church is absolute, is an absolute priority. Paul says, I exhort therefore that first of all. I exhort, I admonish, I encourage. This is not a suggestion. It's a necessity for the life and function of the church of Jesus Christ in and to this world. Prayer. First of all, prayer. It's a priority. We must be a house of prayer. Interesting that that's what... Sergey and I don't know if all the Russian churches talk this way, but they do in their church. They call their church a house of prayer. I like that. A house of... I don't just like that. That's the way we ought to be characterized. Is Community Baptist Church characterized as a house of prayer? Apparently, the church here at Ephesus struggled in this area. Paul, in fact, uses four different words to emphasize the need for prayer. You understand, he could have just said, pray, and moved on. But he didn't. He actually says, I exhort, therefore, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks. He wants you to get the message. I mean, this, this, this essentially summarizes every aspect of prayer. Supplications. Thayer defines this as a seeking, asking, entreating. It can be used, the word, the Greek word can be used of men or God. Here, of course, it's used in reference to God. Supplications, prayer. You see, Paul is not advocating merely saying prayers as a formality. He's advocating seeking, asking, entreating, knocking. We need something. This is prayer prompted by a sense that God must meet it. It's not just that God can, He must meet it. Supplications. Prayers. That's the most common word in the New Testament for prayer. It is used exclusively of God, of no one else. And so He uses this word here, zeroing in on this concept of worship and relationship to prayer. When we go to God, we're going to God. That's what prayer is. It is a, a begging. It's an entreaty. It's, we need something, but we need something from You, O oh God. God our Savior. One God, as He's called here in this passage. Intercessions. The Greek word here is very uncommon. It's used twice. It's used here. It's used in chapter 4 and verse 5 where in the King James it's translated prayer for it is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer or intercession. The word is used in the verb form in Romans 8 verses 27 and 34 in reference to the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ who are said to make intercessions for the saints, intercessions for us. 
And the idea here is there's the emphasis upon boldness and freedom in approaching God in prayer. There's a a familiarity in this word. And the idea of going to Him on behalf of those who can't go to Him, who have no way to go to Him, who have no access to Him, but you, we as the children of God, He's talking to us, we who have God as our Savior, we are interceding. We're going to God on behalf of all men. We're going to God on behalf of a world who cannot go to God, don't have access. We are we're intervening. And then he says, giving of thanks. A fundamental component to prayer. Expressing an attitude of thanksgiving. And it's as we go to Him, as we go to Him supplicating and praying and interceding, we are filled in our own spirit with thanksgiving that we have the privilege to do so. It shouldn't be a burden to us as a church. Sometimes I wonder about prayer in the church. And why are we having a prayer meeting again? Why are we calling for prayer? Don't we pray enough? No, there ought to be a spirit of giving of thanks. That we have actually been given that responsibility. God has placed that upon us. This privilege of going to Him and supplicating and interceding, intervening. That's our responsibility in this world. We often think is our responsibility is going. Do you know before you go, you should pray? Before going comes praying. Before activity comes praying. Before engaging comes praying. Paul is driving this home to our hearts. And he says, you notice that each of those words are plural. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks, all plural, indicating, I think, the need for many. Not just a prayer. I said a prayer. Why do we have to say the same thing again? We said that yesterday. Because we have the need again today. So we pray. Not only do we pray many prayers. We pray continued, persistent, perpetual prayers. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to grow weary. What happens when you grow? Have you grown weary? Did you grow weary this last week at all? No, I'm separating a little bit from the emphasis of the text here, but just to make an application. Did you grow weary at all this week? I did. One day in particular, at about 3.30 in the afternoon, and I lost all sense of connection with everything, the Word of God and everything. It's like I just went blank. And I, and I was suffering at that moment. So what did I do? Well, I pulled out a good C.H. Spurgeon sermon and tried to heat the coals with a C.H. No, I, I cried out to God. I'm not saying you shouldn't pull out a good sermon. I'm just saying, I cried out to God. And you know what? He helped me. What do you do? Church, we cannot allow prayer to become secondary. Every other effort of the church will slide into mere fleshly formalism and our impact in the world lost if we cease praying. We may still do. We may still function. But there will be no power, effectiveness. Notice the scope of our prayers. They're to be broad. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And please, please, do not say, oh, keep reading for kings and for all. In other words, it's restricted. No, that's not the point of the apostle. He's not not trying to restrict our praying. He's trying to broaden our praying here. And sometimes in our attempts to defend a theological position, we miss the points that are being made in a passage of Scripture. Scripture. 
Paul is not discounting prayers for specific people. Paul is not discounting prayers for specific groups. Pray for the saints. Pray for the church. Pray for the elect. Pray for all of these things. Pray for that one individual that you know. Pray for Hymenaeus and Alexander. Pray. Yes, specific prayers are in order. But that's not that. If we were preaching from another passage, we would deal with that. But here, the point is different. All men, I want you to get this, all men in the Scriptures, sometimes when you read all, you'll find all and you'll find those crooked letters in the King James, men, all men. What's that, what that's telling you is that the Greek word all that's used here is found there, but men is added. In other words, it was a masculine use of all and men was a supplied, a provided addition. Okay? So all is determined by the te- by the context, in other words. All what? Well, it's determined by the context of the passage. But then there are those other times where you have all, and then you have men. In other words, there are two Greek words. The Greek word for all, and the Greek word for men. You know that word, don't you? Anthropology. What is anthropology? Study of man. Anthropos is the Greek word. That's the word that's used here. Be made for all men. It's the same two Greek words that are used, for example, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. In Romans 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, Anthropos, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. There it is, all men. We don't say only some men, we say all men, right? That's what it says. If he, if he wanted us to think some men, that's what he would say. He would say some men. He doesn't want our minds going there. He's saying all men, for that all have sinned. You see? So it's, it's in, an inclusive word that is being used. I, I don't know of any more comprehensive way to speak than this. All men. He's pressing the church to pray in an inclusive way. Do you note the the repetition of the word all in this passage? Look at at verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority. That's not restricted. All that are in... Well, the restriction is those that are in authority. All right? Uh, Look at verse 4 who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. It's the all men, the same as what you found there in verse 2. All men. And then in verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all. You'll notice men is not found there because men's not in 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 the original, in the Greek text. So he says, who gave himself a ransom for all. But do you see the broadness? Do you feel it as you read this passage? If you're not, if you're not feeling a, an expansion of thought toward something other than a, than a small group called your particular church, then you're not reading this passage properly. Paul is calling for prayer that extends beyond those who are already believers. All men includes those God wills to save and all for whom Christ gave himself a ransom. Those who have not yet been reached by the truth of the gospel. That's who's included here. Paul understood God's election of grace, didn't he? Did Paul believe that God chose a people before the foundation of the world in Christ who would come to Christ in time? Did God, did did the apostle Paul believe that? Now you may not believe it, but Paul believed that because he wrote about it, right? You can't get any clearer than that. But this did not keep him from praying that, for example, ethnic Israel would be saved. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, in the very middle of a passage where these lofty thoughts of God's electing grace are, are, are uncovered and dealt with to the point where Paul just sort of loses his mind at the end in chapter 11 and just marvels at God. He's too great. I, I can't, I just can't take it all in. It's in the middle of that that he prays for Israel. 
that they might be saved. And he's talking about ethnic Israel. You can't make that say anything else and be a consistent and do a consistent exegesis of Scripture there. And this, this kind of thinking has affected God's people through the ages who are thinking biblically. You remember John Knox? You know what John Knox prayed? Give me Scotland or I die. You have a problem with that? All men. We pray for Turkey, for Thailand, for Cambodia, the Korowai, Siberians, and the list could keep going. India. All men. All men without distinction. I'll say more about this next week, Lord willing. The point here is not every single individual that's ever been born since Adam was created. That's not the point. The point is all men. It's a collective thought, a collective word here. It is all men without distinction. We don't categorize. In our praying, we're talking about our praying here. Jesus said the world is the field and the word is the seed. The world is the field and the word is the seed. And, and, and when that seed is sown, the devil comes along and snatches it away. And Jesus said, so they might not be saved. There are hindrances. And our praying is a part of God's plan in His salvation of His people. When we pray for all men, we are praying for the nations of the world. We're praying beyond ourselves. We're praying for, for, for folks beyond our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the world. And we're praying according to the will of God when we pray for all men. Listen, this ought to liberate some of you because some of you theologically get all twisted up here. But you can read this and if you pray for all men, you are praying according to the word of God. Repeat God's word back to Him. Now theologically, other things can be said. And like I said, we'll talk about that next week. But here we're talking about praying. And you notice what he says in verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. I, I'm, I'm telling you that you're praying according to the will of God. It's good if you pray this way. It's acceptable to Him if you pray this way. I, I don't care if it's not acceptable to you. I don't care if it's not acceptable to some theologian down the street. That doesn't matter to me. Is it acceptable to God? Right? Who will have all men to be saved. We can actually pray that. Lord, your, your servant, the Apostle Paul, said you will have all men to be saved. I want to pray for all men. And, and, if, and, if you, and if you find yourself getting locked up with theological thoughts, why don't you just say, God, you know who those all men are. How about that? You know who they are. who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Rest, don't, don't rest your praying in your own attempts to theologically work everything out. Rest your praying in that which you see God saying you should pray. This prayer fits the commission of God our Savior. What was His commission? Think about it. What was the commission of God our Savior, Jesus Christ? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature, creation, created being. Among all nations, this is supposed to be preached. Isn't that what this, isn't that what you see? And then Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. This prayer fits. The commission that God our Savior has given. And he says, for kings and for all that are in authority. That's part of the all men for whom we pray. It isn't restricted. 
It isn't restricted to our kind. It's not, the, it's not, it's not we, you know, we hate those people in Rome. You understand who Paul is saying to pray for here in his day. It wasn't the friendly president of the United States that, you know, is on our side, you know, waving our flag. You know, we have a presence on our side. No, Nero wasn't on his side. And he's saying, pray for kings and for all that are in authority. He doesn't say specifically what to pray, but it's implied, as we'll see in a moment. But he's saying, pray for, the, for those who are establishing law and order in a society. Pray for those who are the rulers ordained by God, Romans chapter 13. Pray for them. God is the one who appoints authorities. Pray for them. Good rulers, bad rulers, rulers we like, rulers we don't like, rulers that are for us, rulers that are against us, all kinds of rulers. And if you're in Babylon, pray for Cyrus. Who knows? Cyrus might actually issue a decree that's in your favor. Pray for Darius. I mean, go back and read it. Rulers, authorities, pray for them. Read Ezra chapter 6. And you'll find that they were told to pray for them. And that's in the context when Darius was giving a decree that was in their favor. And then the next chapter talks about Xerxes. Or Xerxes. Again, all of these leaders were in favor of Israel's return and rebuilding of the temple. And then the walls in Jerusalem. And Ezra, God told them to pray pray. Paul never pushed for anarchy against wicked authorities. Not that I can see. Paul never pushed for anarchy. I'm not going to go to the steps of the White House. That's not what God has called us to do as a church. I'm not going to try to overthrow a government. Now, this is a controversial subject right here. There are those Historically, who have argued differently than what I am suggesting here, but based upon what should we do? We should pray for them. It doesn't matter if, they're, if, if it's Nero, or if it's on a smaller scale, closer to home scale, Agrippa. Paul stood before Agrippa, and he said, I'm praying for your overthrow. No, he, he preached the gospel to him. Paul never pushes for us to stand up against government leaders. And that goes for any of us, God's people, the saints of God in any nation, whether it's Yemen, whether it's North Korea, or whether it's the United States of America. Now, I'm not trying to suggest here that we shouldn't participate in the, as citizens in the country in which we are. That's kind of another subject, really, how far we should go and so forth. But what I am saying here, the burden that rests upon the church is not political. The burden that rests upon the church is to pray. Pray for our leaders like the early church did. Not rise up in arms, but pray. Christians are not enemies against the state. Our reputation is not to be rebel-rousing, anti-government Christians. That's not what God has called us to be. Well, then why do we pray? doesn't leave us guessing, does he? Verse 2, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That, that in order that, that, this is the reason. This is a because phrase. This is why you pray for all men, including those who are in places of authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty or dignity or respect. We are not then to be political insurrectionists. We are to pray for our leaders so that we might be left alone to live lives that openly reflect our relationship to God. It was interesting, this reference in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah wrote a letter to the captives in Babylon. And here's what he said. Jeremiah, part of what he said. In Jeremiah 29 and verse 7, he says, Seek the peace of the city 
whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it. Pray unto the Lord for this peace. That almost sounds like what... In fact, I suppose Paul might have had this verse come to his mind as he wrote 1 Timothy. Pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. We know that living godly in Christ Jesus will bring persecution of some form upon us. Individually, it will bring some form of persecution upon the church. It always has and always will. But, listen to this, we I can find nowhere, maybe you can correct me on this, but I can find nowhere in Scripture where we are told to pray for that. It is just something that is assumed. You're in the world. The world's going to hate you. I mean, it's, they don't have to pray for that. You don't have to pray for persecution. If you live godly in Christ Jesus, it's going to happen. What you need to pray for is that there would be the ability to lead a quiet and peaceable life. A tranquil life. An undisturbed life. But it's a tranquil and undisturbed life of godliness. And that's so important because, see, what often happens when life becomes peaceful and tranquil, what often happens? We get relaxed. And we don't carry a burden. We kind of like it. We don't want to upset the apple cart. And then what happens is godliness becomes a not as significant an issue for us. We begin to slip. And then the church begins to weaken. And we lose our testimony in the culture. Isn't that what's happening in the United States? It's easy. And so God, historically it seems, God has brought persecution. And in the midst of persecution, there is oftentimes the sense of recovery within the church. In this area of godliness and honesty. Godliness is a big deal in this epistle. We'll say more about it as we move through it. But let me... Turn to a reference in 1 Peter right now. This sounds very much like what the Apostle Paul is saying in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, where he says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That word honesty has the idea of being respected, a life of dignity. In other words, a life so that those who would accuse us, their accusations will fall flat on its face. Okay? Notice what Peter says, 1 Peter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, godliness. Having your conversation, your way, manner of life, honest among the Gentiles, the nations of the world, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation, His visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors, as unto them that, uh, uh, them that are sent by Him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. That's the way we're to live in the culture. If we have been given a, a culture, which we have in this country in a lot of ways, to live a a life that it would be called quiet and peaceable. It's not that way in North Korea. It's not that way in Iraq. It's not that way in other places of the world, in Indonesia, places like Indonesia, or at least places in Indonesia, and many places in the world. We, we've heard reports from our brother in Siberia of the crackdown of authorities and government. They can't just openly do what we do. And proclaiming the gospel, living the life of Christ openly. Paul is saying, pray for that. Pray for kings, for all that are in authority, so that we may live this life. And see, this is really ultimately for the sake of the gospel. The goal for praying for all men, including authorities, is that God's will be fulfilled in the, this message, this very message of truth going to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
when we pray for all men, we participate in God's plan to save His people out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Isn't that what He has purposed? Revelation tells us. That's going to be what's gathered in the end. It's not just blessed Americans. Christian Americans. No, it's going to be people from every... I was watching something last night. There are actually places on this earth where people live, remote places. I mean very remote places where people live, they survive off of the ground still. I mean, 700 people in a community, for example, way up in the Arctic. And I, I guess the thought that came to my mind is I... And maybe it was some of it was because of what I'm studying, but I think I would have thought this way anyway, because I have traditionally thought this way, is I wonder if the gospel has ever been taken to that group. Well, it's just 700 people. Isn't that part of all men? That people group. You see, this becomes real. The goal of this prayer for a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty is not that we might exist in some isolated communal utopian life on earth. But it's so that we might have freedom to spread the message of the truth to all men. And those who come to the knowledge of the truth will be saved. Paul Paul says this in verse 4. He says, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's that's how this salvation works its way out is, is the knowledge. That word knowledge there is a, it's a word for it's not just simple surface knowledge. It's a full cognition, a full knowledge, understanding of the truth and in this context of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have a part in that. So I say to you, we should pray these words back to God with confidence. We should pray that all those that He wills to save will come to the knowledge of the truth. That's praying these words. He says, who will have all men to be saved. We can say, we pray all those who you will to be saved. We can say that. And we can trust Him for it. We can participate in this. Praying that all those that He wills to save will come to the knowledge of the truth. Not a superficial understanding of a deity, but a full acknowledgement and faith of the truth of the gospel. John Knox. He stands out in history, really, but you can find resources to read more about Him, but He believed in the power of God, our Savior. Do you believe in the power of God, our Savior? Do you believe in Him? And therefore, John Knox depended upon Him in prayer. John Knox, it is said, he did not believe in preaching. He did not believe in praying. He believed in the Lord. He believed in the God of our salvation, who has ordained praying and preaching. And therefore he turned to praying and he was faithful in preaching the gospel truth, believing that it would impact nations, including Scotland. Quoting from someone who has written about him, he believed that one man with God is always in the majority. One man with God is always in the majority. During the time of the 16th century Scottish Reformation, Knox's ministry of preaching and prayer were so well known that the Roman Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots, is reputed to have said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. That affects me. I think we've said too many prayers. I'm afraid that we haven't been supplicating, interceding, praying as we ought to pray beyond ourselves. We get so myopic. 
we get so internalized. We get so focused with our burdens that while they, and I have to be careful here because we should pray for those burdens, but those can become all consuming and we forget that God is about something far bigger, far greater, far vaster than you and me. Have you considered that the gospel, see sometimes, and I say this because we, we get so fixated on a theological point that we lose a relationship in our mind and an understanding with the significance of prayer with God. I'm not making this up. God is the one who has ordained this thing, not me. Have you considered that the gospel coming from Jerusalem to Ephesus to Macedonia, to Italy, to Scotland, to England, and then to the United States were answers to the prayers of the saints of old? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about these to whom Timothy is ministering? They got a hold of this reality, reality and they began to pray for all men. Not just those in their day, but those that would come. The regions beyond. And then in time, God answered those prayers. And I'm asking myself, and I'm asking Community Baptist Church, what about us? What are we praying for? We, we, we must do the same thing. We must continue to pray for all men. This is not just a first century instruction. There are still unreached people in the world. There are still kings and authorities that are oppressive. And so we pray for Trevor and Paul's favor with authorities in Papua. Have we prayed for that? Yeah. Yeah. And have we seen God answer prayer? Yeah. We pray for the Korowai. We don't even know the names. We don't have to. That's the point here, I think. All men. You don't have to have names. Send that generic prayer up, if you want to call it that. Pray for those groups. Continue to pray for Paul Brown in Thailand. For the kings and authorities that... Are making decisions that affect him and are affecting others that are laboring, other Christians who are seeking to get the message out. Pray for the safety of the Galavises in Chihuahua. We have prayed for that. God has given them favor. Let's not, let's not say whether it wouldn't have made any difference whether we prayed or not. Why think that way? That, that's that's leading you to be disobedient to Scripture. The exhortation is pray. Chang in Cambodia. Tigreen in Turkey. Sergei in Siberia. In other words, hold the rope, church. That's our responsibility. It begins with prayer. And there are, as I have said, yet unreached places and people. God, we pray, we supplicate, we intercede, and we give thanks for all men. For all men. For kings and authorities. And all that that means, and whatever comes to your mind as you, as you pray these group type prayers, express it to our God. Church, we need to be praying this way. All men. All men. Whatever you conclude, specifically, you must at least conclude this. All men reaches beyond you and me. True? It reaches beyond you and me. He is God, our Savior. Is He your Savior? God, 
our Savior. So He has saved you. Right? Do you suppose someone was praying? And this God saved you. If He saved you, He can and will save others. Is that true? So let's not, let's not, you know, well, I'm in, that's all that really matters. That, and maybe that's a, a, a wrong way of saying it, but sometimes there's that sense, that flavor. Oh, may our hearts be burdened to pray. The task is not yet finished. And God has ordained that we have a part in that task. And it begins with praying. And, it, and, that, and that never ends. Praying. So how about the next time we have a collective prayer time? How about maybe you making more of an effort to be there? If you've chosen to not be there because you don't really see the significance of it? I'm not saying that's the reason that you haven't. I'm just saying if that's a reason. Okay, so don't don't think, well, you're talking to me because I never come to whatever. No, I'm not. I'm talking to whoever it fits. Why do you not? And so let's let's make this a let's make this a part of the burden. Continue to make it a part. It has been a part of our burden. Let's continue. Let's not let it slip. Let's. Stay obedient to this exhortation to pray for all men.